good morning in LA. I guess good afternoon, a lot of other places. We are so delighted today to have with us Jeremy Kagan, a very successful director who all of you know is a member of our faculty, which we're very proud of, and in conversation with Steven Soderbergh. I don't know of a better way to start moving up toward the beginning of the semester than have a chance to hear from these two wonderful filmmakers. So please enjoy, and uh, we know that you're gonna learn a great deal in the next hour or plus, I believe, when you answer some questions. All right, Alex, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, and I'm really looking forward to hearing this conversation. Hi there all, good to, to be able to be seen and see you. Stephen, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, and I'm going to run right into this, which is um, Matisse, the artist, once said that creativity takes courage. And I just feel as a filmmaker, the variety of subject matters that you've chosen and styles and particularly the, the, the variety of ways and technologies that you've experimented with, you've got the courage. So um, I, I thank you for taking the time to be with us. And I'm going to go right into one of the questions because of the nature of how filmmaking is being done and uh, even in the profession right now because of the, uh, the virus um, and also particularly in school, your experience with the iPhone, um, you made Unsafe and, and um, um, a High Flying Bird, uh, I think both on the iPhone uh, with your favorite camera person. And I'm interested in knowing what you've learned about it, what you can uh, share with us so that, because that's the way a lot of things are gonna be shot within the next number of months here at the school. Well, it was technology that I was tracking for a couple of years before I decided to, to really dive in and try and make an entire feature. I'd been experimenting, I'd been shooting footage, um, playing around with it to see how far I could push it. And um, when I saw Sean Baker's Tangerine, um, I thought there's just no reason not to, to move forward. And right around that time, um, some writer friends of mine had pitched me uh, the idea for Unsane. And I said, you know, that sounds like the perfect project to go and do this way. And I, those two films, um, I think, greatly benefited from what I call the gets that come along with a capture device that's that small that you can put anywhere in a matter of seconds. Um, there are things that you can't do uh, because of the size of the, the phone. Um, they're incredibly sensitive to any vibration. Um, so as it turns out, when I had uh, a car mount shot, for instance, um, I usually end up, ended up using a DSLR because it has a little more weight and it, and it would hold the image steady a little more. I'm sure with more time, I could have figured out how to get the iPhone stable, but we were moving so quickly, I just said swap it out for the Lumix and we'll shoot it with the Lumix. Um, and they obviously, for the most part, almost everything is in focus. So selective focus, isn't really a tool that you can use regularly, which, you know, you just have to adapt. You end up shooting with wider lenses and staging things um, with fewer cuts because you can, you can let stuff play within the frame. But I was, I had a blast. Like, I really felt like this was technology I wish I'd had access to when I was the age of a lot of people watching us today, just because you can iterate so quickly. Um, and the new, the new plugins that are available, if you're looking to recreate uh, a very specific look, are, are really amazing. There's, a, there's one uh, called Film Convert um, that you can buy and just get on your laptop and use that's, that's really wonderful. And then, of course, on the higher end scale, there's a company in LA right now called Live Grain that can do really remarkable stuff. They've created some proprietary technology 
that really allows the grain to react to the image that it's being fed in a way that, that almost exactly mimics the way film reacts on a piece of celluloid. So it, it's reading the image and it groups according to what it's reading in the image in terms of density and scale, just like uh, a piece of celluloid does. If you have a close-up of an actor, for instance, and you've shot on film, you'll notice that perceptually there's less grain in the actor's face than there will be, for instance, in the background that is thrown out of focus. It'll look more active. Mm -hmm. And live grain duplicates that um, in a way that's pretty remarkable, whereas something like film convert, it's the same approach for the whole frame. Film convert doesn't know what it's looking at. It's just sitting on top of the image. So you can, and the live grain people have taken all the existing film stocks and basically broken them down so that their software reacts the way that stock would have reacted. It's pretty did, crazy. Did you use any of that in High Flying Bird? Because the lighting in High Flying Bird would make one think that this was not shot on an iPhone. I mean, I, yes, maybe a lot of wide angles for, so there, and I think that's something that you do a lot in the sense of when you're staging a scene, there's depth to what you stage. I mean, you don't put anybody against the wall and if there's a possibility of windows and, and, and in the sets that show us even more so that wide angle lenses play really well there. But the lighting in, in, in that movie is, is, looks like it would be lighting in any movie that was using any kind of a uh, camera other than something that small. Was that because you really, with your gaffer, were doing, and, and Peter Andrews were doing, uh, uh, you know, special lighting for the iPhone, or was it? No, it we worked? had, our, our lighting package was um, a 12 by 12 LED panel. Um, that was it. Wow. And we would use that, uh, we would use that just on the occasions where I felt there was not enough fill light to, to gener generate an image that, that wasn't distracting because it was so dark. Um, but it was, we were 96% of the time, that's all available light. Um, and that's where you're making a decision about, as you said, staging, composition, and contrast. You know, typically on a high flying bird, if I was in a room with a lot of offices, I'm exposing for the exterior and I'm letting stuff go, you know, pretty deep uh, into the shadows, but aesthetically it looked pleasing. We didn't treat that film a lot in post. Unsane got a lot more treatment in post. I wanted it to have a very regular 16 millimeter developed in gasoline kind of <laughs> feel. Um, so we, we pushed the treatment on that one pretty hard. You know, in in the in that there's a there's a there's a scene when she's uh, on uh, given drugs that she didn't expect, and you do this superimposition, and I'm sort of fascinated on lots of levels. Uh, and it's interesting because I'm thinking about in the, in the behind the candelabra, um, the, the 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 stone scene that uh, Matt Damon does. I guess it's a single shot. In it, I'm curious when when you feel that there is a visual or reorientation in term, from naturalism that we're experiencing, let's say, you know, in, in right now, versus um, something that suddenly changes your perspective and how to communicate to that to the audience. Because in the, in the unsane one, you make us experience what she, in a way, is, is experiencing. In, in Candelabra, we're watching him have his experience, but we're not having it. And I'm interested, what makes you make those kinds of decisions about, I want you, the audience, to experience it through the a character's experience versus I want you to watch the character's experience? Right. I think it depends on the combination of the elements that are in play. Um, it depends on what the intention of the scene really is at its core, whose scene is it, um, whose experience of the scene is, is primary, and then is there an opportunity that's organic um, to do something that's very subjective? Will that help? Will that make it better? Or is it gonna be jarring and pull people out of the movie? Um, it depends on tech, 
on a technical level, what's, what's achievable, you know, in the amount of time that you have. Um, for instance, for the drug sequence in Unsane, you know, it was so easy and fast to basically, you know, mount an iPhone in front of and behind Claire in a way that she could move around with a lot of freedom. Whereas with any sort of normal sized camera, even a, even a smaller traditional digital motion picture camera, the weight of that begins to become an issue. It's not as freeing, it's not as safe. Um, so that, that was something I think I had in the back of my head when that scene was coming up that, you know, it's gonna be really easy to do some really weird looking stuff here because it's the iPhone, it'll take five minutes. Um, so sometimes that has, that has an impact as well. On a movie like Candelabra though, you know, I felt I couldn't go that far. The, that the overall toolkit and rule book of how I was approaching that directorially really, really meant there was a ceiling to how weird I could get with stuff or else it would just feel like something that came from another film. And I think that's early on, especially when you're a young filmmaker and you want to try things. Um, this can be a problem. You can, you can indulge in an effect that isolated uh, seems very interesting, but when laid in, against everything else you've done uh, becomes apparent that it wasn't, it wasn't part of the, the grammar of the whole thing. And that's something I think about a lot is what are my rules? What, are, what kind of lenses am I using? What are my rules about when I move the camera? You know, as I talked about in the document, can the camera be in the refrigerator or not? Like that's a, that's a big question for me in determining what my rules are. It's interesting because you've been able to, I think even within certain films, you will, you will push it a little bit. I'm thinking about the, there's a scene when, when, when Michael Douglas's daughter in traffic, where she is, uh, you know, essentially being, I, I want to say not raped, but the, the sexual scene. And you've got the camera where we're experiencing what she's seeing really, really close. And at the end of, I'll jump to another one at the end of Che, which is an amazing moment, I think, cinematically, because of the way you've shot that particular uh, movie, which is essentially we've been watching what's happened, and there are mostly, or feels like wide angle lenses, and there's lots of information in the frame all the time. But when at the end, and this is not a spoiler, Che got killed. When, the, when at the end, you then literally have us be him. And it's an amazing moment, and I'm interested again, was this because this is a shift in a way that story tells, gets told to the very end. In both cases, are these some of the things that, that you have thought about, like you were just saying in Unsane, and they're now executing, or you're on the set and you say, you know what, what if? Well, clearly at that point, the film needs to kick it up a notch. Um, something needs to happen directorially to amplify this this final moment so to, in my mind i was thinking of two things the the close-up of benicio that precedes the point of view shot is the biggest close-up in the entire film it's we are never that close to him until that moment right. and that's a specific setup in my mind for the point of view shot which is going to be the last thing he ever sees yeah. and it felt like it needed that. It felt like the movie needed at that moment to, to jump onto another track um, to, to pull you through the last few minutes of the film. So it was an odd, it, it was a technically odd thing to do only because I'm, I'm, I'm wrapped in a ferny blanket with a face shield and a guy's firing, you know, a, a blank load and then I've got to fall to the ground. And then <laughs> Steven Meisler, the first assistant cameraman, has to manually unscrew the lens from the camera, but in a way that's as, as elegant as possible. So we did five or six takes to get it to where it was. Um, and that was a, the, the removal of the lens was something I think I stole from a David Lynch film. Now, it's interesting when you say 
you, you say in your document that you've given us that it's, you know, it's, it's so important to really know the history of film and to really experience films. And you also said um, that there are certain movies that you rewatch. And I'm interested in what are some that come to your mind right now about movies that I, you know, that you will rewatch? Well, it'll be driven often by what I'm about to do next. You know, I'll start to build a little bucket of homework of things that I want to look at um, that I feel are in the ballpark of, of the thing that's coming. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I watched All About Eve last night um, because I've been writing a lot and that's one of the most perfectly constructed screenplays I think anybody's ever come up with, especially the final the final scene, it's, it's a movie of, of, of one great scene after another. And then this final scene in the hotel suite is so extraordinary in the number of things that it's tying together and setting up in, in just a few minutes. Um, it's, really, it's really extraordinary. And so that was a case where, you know, Joe Mankiewicz was a bright guy. I don't think he stayed up late at night thinking about camera angles. Um, unlike some of his peers, but as a writer in, in that instance, you know, I was just watching the math. I was just looking at the math. Got it. In, in, in um, just you know, with, with something like Traffic, which has so many different sort of feels and styles, do you remember what you were watching uh, it, it, before that movie? And what, what, what? Yeah, I was watching uh, the Battle of Algiers and the French Connection. And whose T-shirt you just mentioned is on your, your <laughs> that's the license, well, license plate from Friendship Connection, right? Got it. Um, there's a line uh, that, that Chase says um, that is, I think, uh, uh, opportunities of, um, I'm just seeing, of most people are determined by forces that they don't see. Opportunities of most people are forces that they don't see. And what I'd like you to talk about to some degree is both in terms of how your career as an artist has developed, what was expected and what came and you had no idea this was going to be part of where you are. And then specifically shooting a movie when certain, I'll call them positive accidents happen. And I know you like to improvise with, with actors. I mean, K Street, I think is essentially mostly improvised. And I, I was just talking to Elliot Gould this morning who was saying to me, yes, he encourages me to improvise. And I'm interested in both ideas. One, in terms of this idea that opportunities most people are determined by things you don't even see. How did that affect your own life and where things happen that you would have never said that this would then determine where you are and what you're making? Well, you know, the smartest thing I ever did was being born to my parents. Um, I was, I was, I had access to opportunities um, that turned out to be unique for me. And, and I had some very weird luck, uh, good timing. Um, I was surrounded at a young age by people that were older than me that, that sort of mentored me and turned out to be uh, to a person of, of extraordinary quality and sincerity. And so my father was a, an educator, a teacher. And so I, I, had some, I had some sort of guidance in, from him about how to treat people, how to behave, um, because he had principles about how he interacted with his students um, that I thought were, were worth emulating. And I know from talking to people that were taught by him uh, that they found him to be a very gifted teacher. And then these college students and professors at LSU that were part of the film program, while I was going to high school on the campus, every day for four years, I went over and hang, I would hang out with these people. And I would make films and I would work on their films. So that was my four years of film school while I was in high school. And they were so generous to me. They treated me like a peer. And I was, I was given the kind of, not only technical uh, education in terms of filmmaking uh, that is 
hard to come by, but more importantly, a philosophical mentoring process that turned out to be incredibly important to my advancement as a filmmaker, especially when things weren't going my way either on a specific day or generally speaking, their, their, their approach to problem solving and their approach to interacting with people turned out to be an incredible tool for me to, to evolve. And what are some of the qualities of that approach, of this? Well, you know, that there's a chain of command, but not a chain of respect. It's, that's, that's rule number one. Um, that you are your audience, that anything you can understand, your audience can understand, that you should be making decisions based on what you want to see. If you second guess yourself, you're lost. You don't know where North is. So that doesn't mean that you're, you're always right in the sense that you, I've made many films that people don't like. Um, I don't view that as an error in my day-to-day -day process. I view that as the luck of the draw sometimes when you decide to go off and make something, you could get lucky and have, traffic was a perfect example. No studio wanted to make that movie. We got greenlit from an independent source three weeks before shooting. Everybody in town said no movie about drugs has ever made a profit. And that's true. And yet we felt the time was right. It was an election year. Um, it was a story that was in the, in the air, we felt. Uh, the sad thing is you can make that movie every five years. Nothing has changed. In many ways, it's worse. Yeah. When, when you have your own sense of doubt, where you're unsure, whether it means uh, you know, a moment of performance or a moment uh, you know, of, a, of how a scene's evolving, how do you handle it? What do you do with your own sense of doubt? It depends on it depends on the, the the issue. If it's if it's a for instance, if you're if you're in prep or you're dealing with some issue uh, that doesn't involve being on set with an actor, so the production designer comes to you with some questions that are important questions about you know uh, the design aspect of the movie. In that situation, I'm very sensitive of how quickly a production can bottleneck if you're not giving people the information they need to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. So if they come at me with something and I don't know the answer to it right at that moment, I make a decision about how time sensitive this question is. Because if it's not too time sensitive, I'll say to them, I need to think about that. And if it is time sensitive, I'll give them an answer, knowing very quickly, I'll find out if that was the right answer or not. But they need to move, they need to, this thing needs to keep going. The worst thing you can have on a production is, like I said, this bottleneck where department heads and people that are trying to do things for you and your project are, are stuck because you haven't made some decisions. What I do on set when I feel like something's just not coming. It's not alive. I can't seem to find a way into it. Um, it's happened a couple of times. I, I slow everything down. Oh, wow. I send everybody away. Um, it turns out, I think, instead of trying to grind on it, I think it's better to put yourself in a pure creative space where there's no clock, there's no money, there's just you and the thing that you're trying to solve, as I said in the document, usually I have a list of questions to ask myself about why this thing's not, why isn't this coming alive? What's, what's wrong? Um, I remember, here, here's an example of sometimes the problem is the solution. Um, on, on the last Oceans film, I, I had a scene in a tunnel of eight or nine people supposed to, standing over a, a set of blueprints and dialogue sort of all around. So I get everybody on set, they're standing over this table and I, I just say, run the scene, just run the scene. So we're running the scene and I just can't find anything that's worth shooting. Like I just can't, I've got the viewfinder, 
I'm, I'm just running it over and over again. I look over at Greg Jacobs, who's my producer AD, who knows me very, very well since King of the Hill. And I give him a look and he immediately <laughs> says back to me, no, we cannot break for lunch. <laughs> it's only 10, 15. Um, and I go, you know what? Send everybody out. Just send everybody a while. You know, I just, let me just send, I sent everybody away. I'm sitting there looking at this table. And I call the swing gang and I go, will you take this table out of here? It's making me insane. I can't, I can't, I don't even want to look at this table anymore. Please take it away. So they take it away. And I sit down on the floor where the table was and I look up and I realize, oh, that's the shot. It's just a series of up angles and I never cut to the table ever to what they're looking at. I called everybody back in. It took an hour to shoot three pages. Fabulous. So that's, I just, I just like slow it down. I just slow it down. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a great example. Um, and, and it's also part of what I was asking about, which is an environment where positive accidents happen, where, you know, you're, you're allowing yourself that, which you did. And I suspect in sometimes in performances, you get something you didn't expect, but it's something that you like even better. Can you give any examples of that, if it's in well, fact appropriate to talk to? Well, there's, there's, there's so many of them because if you've, if you've done your job right, if you've provided, if you have a text and a performer and an environment that is conducive, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna see stuff you hadn't imagined and uh, you're gonna you're gonna be very happy. I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to create a space in which that happens. But you've got to be you, people want to feel that there is a a direction that this whole thing is heading toward. You know what what the crew and the cast are 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 trying to clock is all of your decisions, how you're making your decisions, how quickly you're making your decisions, and then their mind, they're creating an algorithm of where this thing is gonna go. You know, so if they're looking at me, they're like, okay, so I noticed today he likes to do this. He likes that. He liked it when that actor did this. He tends to wanna put the camera over here. Like, they start to now, you know, build a set of heuristics to help them be ready for you when you decide this is how we're gonna go. Like the people that I work with over and over again, if I'm walking around with a viewfinder, they know exactly how long I'm standing in one space before they know like we're gonna be shooting there. You know what I mean? They know exactly what that window is. And, and it's very rare that I'll be there longer than I thought I would be. They start moving and I go, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I, I'm, I go, I'm not sure. I know, I know why you're coming. But, you know, the, so everybody, when, the point being that just like being a parent, if, if you have a crew and a cast that can't seem to make any sense out of the decisions that are coming from you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna run into a problem. You're going to have, uh, people are going to be worried. Um, they're, they're going to not know how to please you, which particularly for a performer is, is the worst thing in the world. They want to know what you want, you know, and they're trying to reverse engineer what you want from what you respond to. And, and if your responses are not consistent or, or non-existent, um, you know, they get scared. And, and I think a scared, lost performer is not gonna come up in the moment with those things that, that end up, you know, sticking with us for forever. And so it's a, it's a very, I think you'd find the sets I work on um, pretty quiet, very focused, um, but not manic. Like the energy is very directed toward where the action is, which is why, you know, on Out of Sight, Out of Sight was the first film I made 
traditional film I made where I threw away all the video village stuff. And I said, you know, we're not doing that. And the first day on set, the producers were really, were really uh, bewildered. And I explained to them, I said, look, the actors hate it. Um, it creates the illusion that something's actually being made over there where these monitors are, when in point of fact, it's being made here where the camera is and where the actors are. And everybody should be mindful of that. Um, and then within two years on traffic, I was starting to operate the A camera and, and, and it became an even more intimate experience with the performers, which I really, which I really enjoy. In, in, uh, uh, there's a moment in the, the laundromat, um, <laughs> and I, cause I want to talk about the performers and that intimacy, but <laughs> there's a moment when, when the characters that Gary Oldman and, and Banderas are playing where they're talking and one suddenly, I don't, can't remember who it is, Banderas or somebody points to where obviously you were <laughs> or one of the camera persons and everybody's looks. Was that one of these moments that just happened? Cause this is what I'm interested in versus the moments that I've done my homework, I've thought it, we've rehearsed this either before we even came on set and it's all, we're kind of get, getting it done as distinguished from, here comes a new idea. Right. Well, in that specific case, the, that was the, a, a sort of writing equivalent of, of an actor doing something on camera in front of you that you really enjoy. Just before we shot that scene, you know, Scott Burns reminded me he goes, you know, I think we both have Delaware LLCs that we have formed for like specific productions. And I thought about it. I said, yeah, I do. I bet I have a bunch, actually. <laughs> so I called uh, our production attorney and he said, yeah, you have five. And Scott had one. And I go, well, we have to put this in here. Like we have to. Um, and so we went to, you know, we told Gary and Antonio, we got to jam these two lines in. Sorry about that. Um, but we have to take, we have to sort of disarm the audience by acknowledging how widespread, you know, this kind of activity is. Um, now, the purposes for my Delaware corporations are not what they were for Mossack and Fonseca, but um, the, that kind of fluidity, I think, is important. Um, but again, it has to, I feel like it has to be structured. In the scene in the in the scene at the bar, which that where it's a closer sh shot of the two of them, I yep. think yeah, two two uh, overs. But there's one where they're looking in one. This is this is after the the the, the that yep. revelation about you know the, the the five and the one that the writer had. They're they they're looking in one direction and then one of the points and then to where the camera is. Yes. Oh, I, yes. How did, how did that one happen? That I stole. Um, there's a gag that's very similar to that in the movie Airplane. Um, when the plane is still in the air, but the news of its impending disaster is going all around the globe and they're showing newscasts from all over the world. And they have one person um, telling the news like on, a, on some sort of instrument. Um, and, and you're in the middle of nowhere. It's not a stage, you're outdoors. And they do a camera switch on this guy as he's pounding out this message. They do a camera switch and he turns to the second camera. It's a ridiculous visual joke. And I've always wanted to do a variation on it. Right. So this was an opportunity. Um, and I, when I set it up, I said to Gary, you know, you got to do this. Yeah, thing and he he sort of looked at me like really and i said yeah let's let's try it um so again i stole it got it uh, yeah, i don't know if you you ever got to see the, um this thing called manifesto which was a series of 13 sort of short movies that um and kate blanchett plays um i didn't all, i heard about it all these characters but there's a quote because they're quoting manifestos and there's a jim jarmusch quote which relates to, very much to what you were talking about in the document you gave which is the originator and the synthesizer and his comment he said there's nothing original it's how you redo it right 
that, but you're not going to invent it. I mean, he was, he was talking about that, in, obviously, in terms of, uh, you know, our, our the filmmaking experience. And here's one where, where you got that quote. Now, I mean, you know, both of these, act, well, one, Gary Oldman's accent, and you've dealt with lots of characters that actually have new voices and different, you know, speech patterns and, in fact, accents. What's been your experience in, in, in sort of how that works? How do you set that up, particularly Gary Oldman's accent? Well, you know, we had, I felt like we had a little bit of leeway here because of the, the hyper stylization of, of the movie. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very stylized uh, right from the beginning. Um, mostly because I think it's, when you're gonna do that, when, you, when you're gonna go that far with something, I feel like it's fair to, to tell the audience right away what they're, uh, what they're in for. My attitude is on a movie like The Laundromat, which is a very polarizing film for people. Um, look, the first two minutes, that opening scene, if you're not happy, you should just get out. Like it is not gonna get any better for you. This is the tone, this is the style. And if, and if, you, if, if you're not clicking with this, just leave. And I was, Scott Burns and I talked about, like, let's go right at them right away. And part of that was, you know, when Gary said, how far do you want me to go? I said, pretty far. Like, I go, you should, you should be far enough from shore that you're not sure you can swim back. And he said, okay. That's, I, I want, I want to, that's a wonderful piece of direction. You know, I, I think I once heard about, I can't remember who, who the, I, I'm trying to remember who the uh, musician is who said, he thinks of the work as walking into the ocean and when he can't touch the bottom, that's when he knows he's in a real creative space. Yeah, right. And so- Well, I think it's, it's always, it's hard, you know, to come up with good metaphors sometimes on yeah. the, in the moment. Um, and which is too bad because they're I think they're helpful to actors if you can come up with good metaphors. I remember when we were doing the informant, there's a scene where where Matt has to stand up and speak in front of a judge and make a little speech. Um, and he did take one, and it was very sincere and and dramatic. And I said, cut, and I went over to Matt and I said, no, Matt, I should have explained. You just won the Golden Globe. And he went, oh, oh, okay. Now I understand. And then he did it the way he, he, does, he does it in the film, which is one of, it's so odd, but exactly right for that character. Almost like an acceptance speech for something that is, you know what I mean? Like that, when, on the rare occasions you can find like that, it's, I think it's helpful to actors because, you don't want to be in their head like you that they want to you want them behaving like the character you don't want them thinking and so i try to find physical physical things for them to do because if they know what the physicality of of the character is in the scene that that everything else like flows from that so i'm very conscious of of blocking of physical blocking are you if you have two characters meeting in a, in a cafe and it's winter time and one of them comes in and sits down and doesn't take their jacket off, but nothing's changed in the dialogue, you've got a very different scene going on now between two characters because one of them is going, what's up? Why aren't you taking your jacket off? And the other one is just sitting there in their exterior clothes and and not acknowledging that they seem to not want to be there that's a that's a physical thing you can give an actor to do that suddenly tees up the whole tenor of the scene for them so would, that's would, what i'm looking for this is interesting that you're talking about the physicality here because there's always the danger of um sort of indicating something versus being it um and and as you said behavior is what we're talking about but in creating a character, um, particularly if the character, I, I, I'm going to look at uh, um, uh, Logan Lucky, I mean, uh, for a second in terms of 
the characters that that they're, they're the, the brothers and all both sets of brothers they're very specific characters and they they're right on the edge of I, as you were talking about pushing and risking how did you discuss with these actors and particularly Channing I want to, you know who you worked with before and obviously Magic Mike how did you discuss creating these characters because you're now talking about physicality as one of the aspects but I don't think it's the only one and it's interesting one more thing which is when you said you don't want them thinking because there's an aspect, I just want to speak to this for a second, about every one of us as an individual character perceives the world differently. And that's who we are. And if you can help the actors see how a character perceives, that's a different word from thinking, the world, then that may be the way they'll discover that character. And I'm interested in what dialogues you have with them either beforehand, uh, if you've got the time, or, you know, as you're beginning to create, help them create who they're going to create. Particularly, I'm looking at that because those are such different characters from who they'd created before with you. Right. Well, I think, you know, to, to your point, when I started out, I used to do a lot of rehearsing. And then I realized what I was trying to get at doing those rehearsals was, was a sense of who... Uh, the actors were as people uh, apart from their characters. And I realized a much more pleasant way to do that is by taking them out to dinner and having meals together, um, which is a much more, uh, you know, much more of a Fellini approach to work than like renting a room and like doing rehearsals. So I started doing that a lot. I started taking cast out to, to dinner because I wanted to know how they wanted to be talked too, because everybody's different. Some actors want you to talk to them, and some actors don't want you to talk to them. Some want you to talk to them, but about everything except the work. Like you, I was trying to, I'm trying to get a sense of what they want. And then I'm looking for opportunities uh, to provide glimpses of what I'm thinking about the character. For instance, uh, Matthew McConaughey on the first Magic Mike, you know, I said, without question, this guy believes in UFOs. Like, there's just no, this is a big, this is a big part of like his worldview is that he believes that. And he, and Matthew being Matthew goes, I know exactly who that guy is. And he didn't need much more than that. But, but to get back I, to- Is there any, I can't remember, is there any reference at all in the movie? I didn't think so. No. I, <laughs> no, but, but for Matthew, Matthew takes something like that and it suddenly becomes this, you know, key component of how he looks at the world. Um, but, but again, one of the reasons that I also stopped rehearsing off of a set prior to shooting is, especially in a thing like Logan Lucky, being in those clothes and having those haircuts and being in the places that we were shooting, um, it has a huge impact on on how they feel and how they're how they're behaving, and so I know. You know, I know for Daniel Craig, the the bleached buzz cut was the key to the character for him. You know, he sent me many emails about him thinking about his hair, like what he wanted to, and he goes, "I think I'm going to try something. Do you want me to tell you what it is?" I go, "No," and a day later, he sent me a photograph of, you know, what he looks like in the movie. And I said, looks great to me. And that for him was, that's what he needed. That's right. For, for Channing, it was the, I remember talking to Channing about this. It was the Carhartt, you know, uh, what should we call it, that he wears the entire film, the overalls, the Carhartt overalls. That for him was the secret to everything. He's like, I, I, he goes, I realized if I had my druthers, I would wear this all day, every day in my regular life. Like, I just love it so much. Like, he was so happy in this Carhartt set of overalls that it completely drove how he reacted to everything. I remember years ago when we were talking about at the DJ meet the nominees about Travick and, and, and Aaron Brockovich, one of the things that you'd said was, costumes I don't know from. 
and I'm looking at the laundromat specifically and looking at Meryl Streep in the, by the way, again, I was taken, this is the second time, you, you and Mike Nichols did this to me, um, the second time where Meryl Streep placed a, a number of characters and I didn't know that she was the right. rabbi in Angels in America. And, and in this case, the, 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 if you will, the spy, the, the, yeah. the, the truth teller here in your, your movie, The Laundromat. But looking at wardrobe, looking at costumes specifically, have you changed over this? Because you're not now mentioning it. How have you changed? What have you been learning? And, and, and how do you work? You, know, you gave us two great examples. I want to pursue it a little more. Yeah, I mean, I've, it's something that I've tried to catch up on a little bit. Um, and it, it is really crucial, I would argue, um, sometimes, more crucial than, than we might admit. Um, actors know this, of course. Um, but I, I've tried consciously, you know, since you and I spoke, to, um, to think of it more conceptually than I used to. What, what, I, what I used to be doing was pretty much just reacting to what I was presented. Um, which is, you know, a, a, when you hire good people, that's not a bad way to work. But I've tried now to think more conceptually as the movie's being written and prepared uh, of what that specific element of design can bring to, to enhance what we're doing. So I'll start to make references and send and pin the images that I'll send to the costume designer saying, hey, I saw this. I think that's kind of interesting. You know what I mean? I've tried to be just a little more, a little more active in, in assisting the costume designer in, in building the world. So, you know, in, I'm better in, than I used Mer to be. Meryl Streep's choices, because again, the, what she wears so much in this, I mean, but she also has this other voice that she created. Do you remember the conversation before you started working with her? All we talked about was, I have to get you as far away from yourself as possible. You know, there will be some people that will twig this right away, but I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for, you know, having as many people be surprised at the end as possible. There was a lot of freedom in it because she doesn't exist. She's not an actual character that exists. She's a construct. She's a, she's a comic uh, piece of business that we set up and pay off at the end of the movie. So there's a lot of freedom there for her because she's not portraying anybody really. So we never really even talked about the accent, which to me is of indeterminate origin. I don't know if she's Greek or Italian or Israeli. Like I never asked her, who, who is this? Because it didn't matter because she wasn't real. So I think she really enjoyed that. Like she, she still has the, it's kind of amazing to be around. She still has the enthusiasm of the amateur. She, her affect on set is the affect of somebody that is being paid to do this for the first time. Like that's how engaged and excited she is. It, it was really, I, I loved it. Like it was, it, was, it was like an energy source that I, that I plugged into. She was amazing. When you, um, uh, she wears this strange thing that she takes off because she's got, she's got something that uh, makes her thighs much bigger. Her choices, your choices, your discussion, Arm. obviously beforehand. Yeah, those were all hers. The hair, the glasses, every, it was all hers. I told her, go to town. In the, um, when you're working with, with, with people that are so experienced like she is, but also, I'm thinking of all the, uh, you know, Ocean Eleven, Twelve, and Thirteen. You're, you've got some spectacularly talented and experienced actors, and they may have, it, as you just said earlier, different ways to communicate um, to you and you to them about what you want. How do you, did you deal with the groups? Um, well, I had a lot of help in the sense that. I had Jerry Weintraub, the late great Jerry Weintraub, who was who was the perfect person to to produce one of those movies because he's very very good at taking care of people. 
He's just good at taking care of people. And um, that coupled with George, who, who is a leader, like is, is a real leader. And, you know, very much kept that group sort of entertained and engaged. Um, he helped me a lot because those were, those are for me, um, tricky movies to make. Um, you would think somebody would look at traffic and go, oh, that's a tricky movie to make because of all the stuff. Um, the first oceans was, traffic was not hard. Uh, the first oceans for me was hard. I was working in a, in a sort of style that, that I hadn't really worked in before. And, and I was, uh, there were times when I was really struggling, trying to figure out how I wanted to do it. Um, it was shot completely out of sequence, but I'm trying to visually link things um, throughout. Um, it, was, it was tricky for me. And George was very helpful in, in recognizing that I was spending more time building out the visual aspects of the movie than I might normally. And, and as a result, you know, he kind of made sure that, that everybody was, was being attended to and, and cut me a lot of slack there. So I don't know what, if I hadn't had Jerry and George, I think for the actors, it would have been a little different, but I, I, I was lucky that that group legitimately really enjoyed each other and, and, and you know, I was I was able to, like I said, I was I was a little more camera focused on those than I would be normally. Got it. Um, let me jump to to uh, um, uh, uh, an issue. Just I'm thinking about the nature of effects, and there's a green screen behind you at this moment, and thinking about your evolution and our evolution as filmmakers in terms of I'm looking at the train wreck and Che. Um, in the first one, which is a spectacular piece of filming. And I assume it was not CGI, where I'm looking at the wave in the laundromat when the boat goes around, over, turned over, and I assume, this is, again, I figured that wave was CGI. What's been your feelings about this, and particularly your feelings about, it, and ways to do this when, you know, you don't have a lot of resources? Well, it's, it's, I think, you know, my experience is you spend time or you're willing to spend time on the things that you're really into as a director. Like you can, I feel like I can tell watching a film, you know, what the director's really interested in by what they lavish their time and attention on. Um, most of my focus and interest is on the performers, uh, Primarily, so things that slow me down, I tend to have uh, a very complex relationship with. And when you're doing effects, whether they're stunts or visual effects, this stuff slows you down. So I'm, I'm always looking to either minimize them or simplify them or, or execute them in some oblique way that could be both more interesting or funny and also can happen more quickly. So a perfect example of this is in the first oceans where Don Cheadle's watching on TV, a building being demolished that's in the window right behind him. Right. Like that, that, that kind of stuff I like. Um, going and actually having to do multiple shots of that building imploding, not so much. Um, so uh, that's one of the reasons I'm not a great candidate for you know, any sort of heavily effects driven project because I just don't have the patience for it. Now, the good news is the new LED screen technology that's developed over the last couple of years has allowed for um, a much more real world approach to doing fairly complex visual effects sequences. And that's fantastic. You can move faster, it looks better because all the surfaces are picking up all the ambient, you know, 
light from the screen. So you've got reflections that are accurate and real. You know, it's, it's, it's a really great advancement in technology. And that interests me a little, but did I you think- do, Did you use any of that in uh, the laundromat? No. Got it. So have, and have you, uh, where, have you used it yet or you're, you've been studying and seeing how no, it works? I've been looking at it and talking to people because I think it's really interesting. Um, and, and in terms of that sequence in the laundry uh, uh, with with the wave and the knocking down the boat, how did you do it? Um, we were in a tank over at Universal, so it was all. We were outside, um, but one, once the boat started to move, we were we were in a tank with giant green screens and all that stuff. Very very slow moves, very slow. You got to be careful, of course, but it's um, it's not my metabolism. Uh, it's not really built for that. And there's a shot in the laundromat where uh, it's near the end where we find out that they're sort of in jail and but it starts with them on I guess the beach again and that transition um, which is all it looks like it's one shot and it's very very fluid. Do you recall conceiving of it and then how it got executed? Yeah, those, the, all of those scenes, Scott Burns and I, you know, wrote as they appear, both the, the opening and, and the ending shots. Um, and that one, that one was fairly straightforward. There was a, you know, a green screen behind uh, the jail cell, and then we stripped in the beach and then the bars and, and all of that. It still amazes me how, these things get accomplished because it it seems impossible that it could be that transparent and smooth. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. But um, though it was fun on that film to to use VFX technology to do something other than you know create a spaceship. It, it was fun to use it as as part of this you know theatricality breaking of the fourth wall putting people somewhere and then having them be somewhere else. It was fun to use it for that instead of just, you know, destroying a planet. Got it, got it. The, the, in terms of your own homework, let's say the night before you're about to shoot something, uh, on any film, I don't know if it's changed, but what, do, what, what's your homework the night before? Well, it depends on how much editing I've done that evening, because typically I'm editing the day's footage after, within an hour after we wrap. Um, it's very rare that I don't have an assembly of that day's footage within about 90 minutes. Um, so then I have a choice of either, depending on where we are in the film, going back and looking at other sequences to get a sense of where we are, or just putting in a movie to watch uh, as homework to kind of both be thinking about ideas but also cleansing my palate. Um, but I might put something in that's just a complete, you know, escape. I'll put in, you know, some 50s melodrama or something just to, to cheer me up and, and get my mind off of work for a minute. So I, I have, you know, I bring a stack of stuff. Do you, are you a dreamer? Do you dream? Oh yeah, especially when I'm shooting. And yeah. what what are your dreams about? Oh, they're terrible. They're things are things are going wrong. Everything's going wrong. And are they are they about the movie itself, or are they just you know yeah. things going wrong? Period. I had I remember one particularly terrifying dream when I was shooting Kafka. Um, I I I arrived on set and had somehow forgotten that I'd cast Paul Hogan as Kafka and and the ramifications of that decision were starting to <laughs> appear to me as I walked on to the set and I thought wow this is going to be hard cuz he made it clear he still wants to wear like he still wanted to be dressed as crocodile dundee but he wanted to be Kafka and I I my dream was like how how is this going to work like I think Alec Guinness is really going to really have a problem with this so it's stuff like that. Oh my God. What's the first thing you do on the set when you arrive? I usually get there early. Um, I usually show up about a half hour early, you know, grab something to eat and go right to the set before anybody's on the set. And that's my favorite period of 15 or 20 minutes 
alone. Like there's nobody there. I'll have the sides with me and, and I'll just kind of be in it, you know, before people show up. And sometimes I'll have a couple of ideas uh, based on that. Sometimes I won't, but I like being, it's, I know there are some people that are late all the time and they feel it puts them in a position of power, which I've never understood because I feel like you're already back on your heels. You're apologizing before anything's even happened. So for me to get there ahead of everybody else, I feel like I've gotten a little bit of a head start on everybody. And I don't know, it makes me, it's a cheap way to feel good. Who's, <laughs> so, but who's the first people you will, you will talk to once they start arriving? Oh, the AD first AD. And what will you be speak, speaking about? Um, is there anything I need to know that I didn't know the last time I saw you? <laughs> you, know? um, you wanna know, it's like something happened that's gonna affect what we're about to do. That's the first thing is like, do we have everything that we've all agreed that we need? So it could be, you know, in the, in the three decades I've been doing this, um, and beyond, I've only raised my voice on a movie once. And it was when an actor, one of my lead actors showed up late for a second day in a row. And I was standing in their parking space uh, when they pulled up and I let them have it and made it clear that's not acceptable. Um, so, you know, other than that, I'm, I'm looking for and that was something that I learned when I rolled up and the first AD, Greg Jacobs told me, you know, uh, so-and-so is not here. And I said, again? And he said, yeah. And I sort of shook my head and, and it really made me angry because I don't like that kind of confrontation. And I was angry that they'd put me in a, in a situation in which I have to get up in their grill. Like I resented that, that they were being unprofessional and, and that I had to talk to them like this. It was not, you know, I don't, some people tell stories about, you know, well, I, you know, I went in there and I talk, I don't like to roll in somewhere and like yell at people and create a scene. Like that's not how I like to work. So I was, I was upset that, that they put me in this position. Got it. When an actor disagrees with you, um, how, how have you handled it? And this is not, I'm not talking about this in the terms of the, uh, you know, that, which was unprofessional, but just, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, the actor says, I don't feel that this is the way this character would go or whatever. How, how do you deal with it? Well, it depends on the actor, uh, depends on the, the context, even of that day. Um, th that conversation, you know, near the end of a shoot is a very different conversation than on day one. Um, so it's, you've got to, you've got to like in your mind quickly do some math about, all right, where the first thing you're trying to figure out is where is this coming from? Is it, is it, is it what it appears to be? Or is there a subtext here that this is covering? That's the first thing you got to figure out. Um, if it's a, if it's a, absolutely legitimate thing coming from a place of real uh, questioning, then I love having those discussions because one or two things are gonna happen. I will either convince them or they will convince me. And I'm not gonna say yes just to go along to get along. I'm only gonna say yes to something because I think about it and I've, done, and I've added it into the entire thing in my head and I've gone, you're right, that's better. I get to decide what's better, but you know, um, if I feel this is coming from somewhere else and, and most likely in those, in, in those scenarios, it's a delaying tactic, um, then, I will, then I will do my best quickly to figure out why they're having this sort of performance anxiety at this particular moment and we'll fix that, you know. Will you, will, you, will, you, will you speak to that itself or will you find a, a way of, of, of addressing? I don't know if there's a specific example that's occurring to you now that, that might say, oh, I can see this was a performance anxiety and I now am able to 
say this to the actor so that she he doesn't they don't feel as pressed yeah i mean if i can if i can quickly figure out where i think it's really coming from then i will that will determine depending on what that is that'll determine whether or not i can sort of say something to get us on track and we can kind of stay here on set and keep working or if it's something where i go oh you know why don't we do this let's take a minute like i want i want to i want you to go talk to so and so i'm going to go talk i will create i will create a little pause that will buy both of us a little bit of time to to solve the real problem so you know it's as you know it's a, a little bit of therapy and and um it's really everybody wants to be heard they just want to be heard yeah. you know um, talk to us about um, the issues of casting and in particular the way it's changed over the last number of years and in fact what's happening to casting right now which is you may not even be able to meet an actor um, you're doing it like we are doing it on zoom what's your experience what are you learning how can you find out that this is the person that you want who's on this video but is not necessarily when you get them in the room the same person what are you what are you learning well, here's what I here's what I request um, from my casting director is is that they they do the scenes and they allow uh, the actor as many opportunities to do the scene as they wish. And then I want 10 or 15 minutes of them just interviewing the, the performer as themselves. Um, it's really important to me to be able to see get a sense of who they are um, apart from what I've asked them to do. It's a very unnatural thing, auditioning. And, and so I want, I, I, I want to get a sense of them. And it's happened to me on numerous occasions that I have sparked to what I saw in the unscripted, you know, conversation that they were having with the casting director to such an extent that I've decided either to recalibrate that role to capture what I was seeing of that real person, or I've seen something and I go, actually, you know what? They're actually better having seen that conversation. I think they're better for this other part. Let's cast them in that part instead. And so what, are, what, are some, what are some of the conversational things that, that, that you're, that you would do if you were doing it or your casting person is doing it. What are they about? I mean, what, what's, being, what's being discussed with that human being as a singer from that human being reading the lines? Really basic stuff. Where you grew up, do you have brothers and sisters? Uh, you know, personal stuff, I mean, personal stuff about how they got here. You know, where did you go to school? Where did you go to school? Have you ever, where have you lived throughout your life? Have you ever lived outside of the US? Um, do you like, you know, when you did, I've seen their resume, of course, so there may be, I may have questions already that I'll prompt the casting director perhaps to ask them about. Um, but I really, I want something of them. You know, I want, I want to know what they're like, what, and what they like. Got it. And in specific ways, what they like, I mean, might you, if you were casting right now, say, how are you dealing with the virus? I mean, might that be one of the kind of questions that would be asked? Yeah. Where, you know, where were you the first week of March? <laughs> like that kind of thing. Sure, absolutely. But I think just, again, it's so revealing. I hope not in an unpleasant way for them, but how people talk about themselves and what they choose to tell you is incredibly uh, interesting and, and I think efficient. In, in sort of answering the question I want to know, which is, you know, who are they? What are they like? Now you've worked uh, as like with K Street, but uh, uh, with improvisation with actors. What? How do you know, like in the casting, that this person may be able to do that? And when do you want to do that? I mean, is that is that a constant for you, or is it just depend on the particular movie, and, or like in, obviously in K Street? Yeah, it depends on the project. I mean. Mm -hmm on K Street and on Bubble and on the Girlfriend Experience, these were 
very, very tightly structured improvisations. Everybody in those projects, whether they were professional actors or non-professional actors, understood that the scene had, for instance, four bullet points that needed to be discussed. So they know where they're going. And the goal, obviously, is for them to express those ideas that we're trying to get across as themselves or as the character. What I discovered with, with Bubble and GFE, where I was dealing with, with non-actors, is it was, it was fun in a way because they, they don't, they, some of the things that are just wound into actors, they don't have. For instance, the, the, the idea of like trying to win a scene, like that just doesn't occur to them. Like they're not thinking that way. They're not thinking that there's like a goal to the scene. They're just sort of in it. But what I discovered is how quickly they pick up those tendencies. So as a result, on both of those films, I never did more than two takes because even after two takes, they started performing. They started picking up the things that performers do and adjusting things to make themselves win the scene or look better. It was, it was fun to watch. Um, that's, but, that's, that's fascinating. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, Real Foreman's Fireman's Ball uh, as an example of, of uh, non-actors giving spectacular performances. Um, and I'm wondering, when do you know you've got it? This may be from a non-actor and from an actor. When do you know, okay, I got it? Um, well, usually, again, what I was going to say with the non-actors is you can't give them lines. You can give them subjects, but you can't have them memorize. If they have to memorize something, they're, they're done. Like, they're out. They're outside of themselves. You have to keep them inside of themselves. So I, there, in a way, for me, there wasn't really a wrong answer. If they, if they hit all of the points that I needed, then I was moving on because giving them notes, giving a non-professional actor who's improvising off the structure notes, you're just going to kill it. You're going to kill it. Right. So we were... I was, we were moving pretty quickly. And as a result, the aesthetic of those films was driven by the fact that I had to shoot multiple cameras almost all the time got it. for that reason. Because every time they did it again and again, it got worse. So more often than not, especially on Bubble, I had three cameras going a lot. Now, what would you, how would you choose these non-actors? In the My cast casting director. The, same, the, same process? The lead, actress, the lead actress, Debbie, in Bubble, uh, Carmen Cuba, uh, was, got her drive-through lunch at McDonald's from her. She was at the window. And Carmen, Carmen was like, this woman's amazing. And she pulled over, got, got her McDonald's, pulled over, and went back in and asked her to come be on tape. That's how we found her, in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And, in, and, and on the tape, though, because you didn't, I'm this non-actor, she is, you didn't want her to read lines. What was the sort of, was it like the interview kind of process? And that yeah. how you knew? Yeah. Got it. Um, let, let's jump to uh, talking about locations. Um, and I, I'm thinking actually, uh, particularly about Contagion. Um, and, and in fact, I'm thinking about at this moment, the many, many sort of uh, meeting rooms that, that, that you had to shoot because of the story, um, and also when places were empty. Uh, I get, talk about how you determine a location um, and, and, and maybe be specific about the contagion. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it seems obvious, but... Um... Our physical, the, the physical environment that we occupy, I think, has a huge impact on our, our mental state, and as a result, our physical state. So I've always been drawn to movies that pay a lot of attention to that aspect, um, and, that, and that really make you aware 
of, of the physical environment that the characters are occupying. You'll see, you know, especially in Contagion, but in almost everything, you know, I'm, I'm continually showing you the entire space and placing the, the characters within it, sometimes small, sometimes not. But I, I'm always looking for a way to you be, for you to be oriented physically in the space that the actors occupy. And you really, that's why I like panning shots. I know a lot of people don't. I love a good panning shot, especially if you have a little counter dolly in the move, uh, in the middle of it. I, I, like, I like seeing people move from one space to another. It gives me a sense of, of where we are. And then you start to break down what that space is by its shape, um, its texture, what's in it, what time of day it is, how it's lit, um, how many people are gonna be in it. And in the case of Contagion, everywhere we went to shoot in the world, um, we were on the lookout for any kind of adjacent space that we could shoot for that montage of things being empty. Right. So that was just whenever we were out and about, the location manager would go, hey, half a block away, there's a gym, uh, a giant you know, g subscriber gym, and they said they'll empty it out for us for 10 minutes, and we would run over there you know, and grab a shot of that. We would just do that all the time. If we were at an airport, we would talk to the airport people and go, hey, could you guys just clear out this area for five minutes so we can get this one? So we were just collecting these images as we moved around. And it was, um, over the course of the shoot, you know, it was one of those things. I didn't realize how many shots we had until we were done. And, and I thought, oh, we got, we got enough. Like I was always worried for that montage there's another montage of when they're hearing about um growing the vaccine and you see all these boardrooms there's like that's that's um, yeah, boardrooms yeah yeah like boardroom after boardroom after boardroom and those are to try and find rooms that were distinct um all basically i think we shot all of those in chicago it was that was tricky and you know, I want to talk about the people who are in those boardrooms. Uh, and I'm going to call it the background artists. Um, uh, how are you determining who those people are? Uh, they may not even have a line, but they're there. And uh, I'm going to ask you that also specifically in Che, where you have an enormous number of players. They're speaking Spanish. Um, and some of them look like they're the real people, like particularly yeah. the second one in Bolivia. I, how did you determine who's going to play what? Well, you know, in terms of background, that's a really important aspect of, of a movie that, that doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, and we have, we have people that's, that, you know, that back, that's their job. That's all they do is cast people who are in theory not speaking, although as you know, sometimes you upgrade people because of something that's happening on set. Um, because it's sort of, it's one of those things, it's one of many things that people only notice when it's done badly. You shouldn't notice it at all. And they only do when you've done it badly, either by choosing bad people or staging them badly. Um, in the case of Che, uh, that was just, um, that was tricky because of the, not only the, you know, the sequence in which those movies were shot, which is we shot the second movie first backwards. Then we had a pause of two weeks. And then we shot the first movie in fairly close to being in sequence. What but was the what logic behind it? Was, why, why, why do that? Well, because Benicio had to be as thin and, and overgrown in terms of hair as possible. So he started the movie at his absolute thinnest and he hadn't had a haircut or a shave in months. And so then we made him gradually less skinny and less hairy and then started over on the second one. Um, the tricky thing in Che was how important, and this is something that I had to rely on other people for, the accents are critical. Somebody's accent 
really determined a lot about how other people interacted with them. So, so in casting people who are supposed to be from a certain place and from a certain class in that place, we had to be very diligent about how people spoke Spanish. And that turned out to be very complicated. And we ended up in some cases doing a lot of looping to make sure that there was consistency. And, and in terms of finding these pe people, particularly, and again, the non well, there's a part in there, which is the, 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 the farmer who ends up, you know, turning them in and a, a trader. It, 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 he's an older yeah. actor and he's, I think he's amazing. Now, I don't know whether he's someone that acted before or someone. Yeah, he's a fairly well-known Spanish actor, as it turns out. Like in Spain, he's been working for 40 years. And we were, you know, when, when I was, we were lucky to get him and he was happy to be there. So everybody got what they wanted. Uh -huh. um, but it was. Now, what did you do? I mean, I don't know how good your Spanish is, but what did you do in terms of the understanding and directing in a language that maybe is not your first? I had this fantasy that I was gonna really become a Spanish speaker during the shoot, and, and I was working on it. Um, but what it, what, it never got good enough to be, to be really fluent, but I did have enough to be able to communicate very basic things. And since, you know, Peter Bushman and Benicio and I had poured through this script, you know, over and over and over again, we're constantly working on it, constantly writing in English, and then it would be translated. I knew what they were saying. So I could tell, I could tell if there was a problem, if something didn't sound right to me, just tonally, if, you know, I, I knew what they were saying. So I was able to say like, no, I think you're being, you're rushing that or you're being too, you're being too angry when you say this line. Like I, I, I knew what they were talking about. Um, but it, it's funny, the little Spanish that I knew as soon as we wrapped, like completely vanished. I, I just, I didn't have enough space. Talk about staging um, and your process. I mean, there's in that movie. There's there's incredible amount of movement that because of just the nature of it. Um, how do you go about staging a scene, even maybe even with with two characters, and you decide when they're going to move? I was thinking about there's a scene in Magic Mike uh, when the two of them are walking and they walk, I guess, into a park or something and sit down, and then she gets up and leaves, right. and it and. I mean, it's clear that you, with the actress, made a decision here. I mean, that scene could have been played to two people sitting at a table. Um, what is it that gets you to be able to say, I want these people to move and, 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 and then accomplish it? Boy, if I, can, if I can organically get somebody moving, that's really the goal. Um, but, but it does have to be organic. It shouldn't just be movement for the sake of movement. But... I, it's, it's, I have a real lack of imagination um, when it comes to, I don't storyboard. Like I, I find that I, I need to see it. I need to be there. I need people to be in their outfits. I need us all to be there. And I need to start, I need to see it up on its feet to, to determine what the blocking is gonna be and how I wanna cover it. And so um, when you're dealing with, a movie like Che, for instance, um, you know, the, the Battle of El Ivero, which is very early on in the movie and is this sort of pre-dawn raid on a small barracks. Um, you know, we know, we, know, we know what the action's gonna be. We know Che's gonna run from here to here and he's gonna hide behind this. We know these people are gonna come out. But beyond that, you know, I'm there, that was shot over three mornings, three different mornings. Mm. You know, I'm basically there before the sun comes up and I've got the first few shots figured out and then I'm just, as I see it develop, I'm going, okay, now we're over here. Okay, now we're over here, now we're over here. And we're just going as, I'm keying off of what I'm seeing um, as fast as I can. Um, that's the fun part to me is when, when you when it finally it's almost like a flip book the thing that unlocks the whole sequence and you know exactly what it is and then you just time seems to go so slow because you're just now clicking off 
the shots that you've already seen in your head, and it takes hours and hours to get them all. So um, in this case, you're, you, in, in, you're not having, you said uh, storyboards is not yours. Are you and your AD and your, and if you're, if you're talking to Peter Andrews, your camera person, are you, are you three and a half or two and a half have a, uh, a shot list for the day? Or is it, no, we know this is the sequence we're going to do the day, but the actual shots, it's going to be determined as you just explained. Mostly. On, on rare occasions, um, I'll make a shot list just to have a plan in my pocket mm -hmm. um, with the understanding that it could go a very different way. But if it's a sequence that I have, that we have real, which on Che was every day, if we have real time constraints and, and I feel like um, based on what I'm reading, you know, here's what I, here, here's what I have to leave here with. You know, if I don't leave here with these shots, we don't even have a scene. Um, so I may do that just to help out um, the, particularly the AD and just say, look, here, here's what I'm thinking. We're gonna do this. This is gonna take about two hours. So that other big thing that we've got, you know, make sure that that's up and running by 10 o'clock, get all the extras ready because we're gonna go right from here to here. Like I'm trying to help the production so that people aren't, you know, flailing. Um, in, but, in A, you had um, this, the sequence at the United Nations, talking about locations, actually. Um, uh, and it sure does look like you were shooting at the United Nations. What, what did you do? Yeah, we, we managed to get in there. They were just about to shut it down to do some renovations and change the look of a lot of the areas that we wanted to film. Um, but we got in there, and boy, not a bad angle in the joint. I loved shooting there. We shot so much footage. And it was a blast, like seeing seeing him in that space with like all the whole room filled with extras and him giving that speech was kind of amazing. Like it was really fun. I loved shooting there. Uh, how many, were you there for a number of days? That was two days. Two days, it's amazing. And a number of cameras, I assume. This is oh yeah, we had, we had three and I think at one point four, we were shooting a lot, yeah. Very specific question in Che. The horse that he can't make move. Yeah, that's, the, that's an example of why I have never made a Western. <laughs> um, I find horses terrifying. Um, I really do. I had a good friend of mine who uh, was killed on horseback. Um, I find them terrifying. They're huge. They, 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 you know, if they have a mind to, they will uh, disobey. And there was a lot of discussion. I was very worried about Benicio. Um, and they rehearsed that over and over and over again. It was really tricky. And that was one take. That was a horse that was trained not to move. Well, yeah, and by, you know, but that's the thing is it has to be like Benicio's got to be a part of that training because the, you can teach a horse to do something, but it's really best if they're doing it with the person that taught them. Got and it. so it was, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because that's just one of those, yeah, I'm not a horse guy. I, I, I was a producer on Godless, the, the series on Netflix that Scott Frank did, and 114 days of shooting, and I made it clear to him I would not be visiting the set. <laughs> and I didn't. I want to talk about color. Um, the choice to do all of the sort of UN stuff in black and white. Um, um, and let's look at traffic and all of those phenomenally di different color styles. When is that in your mind? When are you making that sh those choices? That's usually pretty early. I mean, again, you're just trying to help the audience out a little bit. I, I think one of the one of the things that shouldn't be a question as they're watching anything is where are we? Um, so I, I'm, I'm up for any, any way you can orient people so that as soon as you cut someplace, they know where they are. Um, I'm up for that. Sometimes it's color, sometimes it's stylistic. You know, you may have one section of the film that's handheld and one section of the film that's locked off. Like anything that will help orient them, I'm up for. 
And you have so many tools, you know, to, to put somebody in a space. Um, I feel like did, you- Did you know, in, for example, in, in traffic, did you know that um, you were going to sort of do the burnout stuff for a lot of the Mexican stuff and, uh, and, and the sort of the blue color for the, you know, uh, the other sequences? Was that the choices made beforehand? Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, in all those cases, there were very serious and irreversible uh, decisions being made with filters on the negative uh, that meant there was no going back. So, you know, it was all very planned and tested uh, beforehand. Although in San Diego, the first day we were shooting in San Diego for those sequences, for the Catherine Zeta Jones sequences, we were doing something uh, called flashing the negative. Mm -hmm. um, and so that means basically you expose your footage, you send it to the lab before they process it, they re-expose it to a predetermined amount of white light, and then they process the negative. First day of shooting, word comes back from the lab, none of it's good, it's all NG. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What happened? And they're like, we don't know, there's just, uh, there's nothing there. <laughs> and I went, well, clearly there was something there and then something happened and then there was something not there. And it happened somewhere between our set and, and the developer. And they were like, we don't know. And we never found out and we just had to reshoot the whole first day. But that was the risk in, in that case of putting the film through an additional step of exposing it to this white light. I think somebody hit 100% on the white light dial is what <laughs> happened. And they just exposed everything and it was all just clear leader. Let me uh, ask you two more questions because you're giving us an enormous amount of time and I really appreciate it. The one question has to do with the nature of, you actually speak, speak, speak to it in Liberace when he says uh, a, a line, our business is not to change the world, our business is uh, just to entertain the world. Or, and what I'm interested in is when you make a movie like Che, you make a movie like Traffic, you make a movie like The Laundromat uh, and Aaron Brockovich, these really are movies about our situation, the social and political and economic realities. And I'm interested in when you step back and say what you would like to accomplish with those movies, um, uh, having chosen them and, and, and that wonderful lie that you have Liberace say, you know, right. uh, where are you on all that? Well, I think, well, Here's one thing I know is that we need stories. I mean, I know as a species that we need stories. This is how we learn. It's, it's, that's, that is wound, the, the, the need for narrative is wound into our DNA. So I know we need stories. They've always been there. I'm, I'm, I find the, the, the Chauvet cave paintings in France to be incredibly moving. They're beautiful. And, and the fact that it's pretty much the first sort of, you know, art that, that we're aware of so far and, and what they chose to draw is so interesting. Um, and, the, and they're really good. Like when I, when I first saw the images from those walls, I'm like, where was the practice wall? Like, these are really, these are really like great drawings. Um, so, so it, what were they, they were clearly trying to communicate to somebody else, like, this is what our life is like. They were drawing the things that, that were important to them. And I find that just really, that, 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 again, that you can reach across time and they could tell me their story. That to me is amazing. So I think there's value in that just on a practical level, because it's how we learn. Um, as far as changing people's minds, I'm not sure that's how art works. I think it, it, can, it obviously can create awareness and it can obviously expand somebody's idea of what exists and what's possible. And I think there's a value in that. But beyond awareness, beyond somebody being aware of a certain situation 
or or a certain historical figure. I, I don't know. I don't know that you could quantify the 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 result of that in terms of policy or a ballot box. I just don't know. And I think it would be dangerous to to walk around assuming that you have that kind of impact. Got it. I, I think that's well observed. I think it, it needs to be collective. I mean, it's not one movie or one article or, or about a subject, but it's going to those caves. Many, many of these animals running around and I'm getting repeatedly and I get, oh, there's real danger from them. Yeah. How have these movies changed you? Um, well, it, it, you know, it goes, it goes in both directions. Um, you, you are inspired by what people have done. And then you're also, you also despair over what people have done, you know? So they, they put you further and further into the, you know, the human experience that we're all a part of. Um, and as with anything, it's not all good or all bad. And, and I think all, all I can do, the one thing that I won't spend time on, lavish time on, um, is cruelty. Cruelty to me is a, a specific aspect of human behavior that I don't really have much interest in portraying. Um, and, and by cruelty, I mean, you know, the, the, active, the act of making somebody suffer for pleasure. Um, this, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in watching it and certainly not interested in shooting it. In terms of, let's, let's talk uh, two more things. And, uh, um, uh, that meant four. Uh, <laughs> television. Um, your experience as a director in terms of, like, for example, the Nick. Um, what uh, have you learned? What would you say to uh, new directors who are looking to express themselves um, where that tele television experience ex uh, occurs and how is it, how is it, how is it, not, I was about to say different, but it isn't, I know that. Um, but talk a little bit about it because you've chosen to do a lot of it. Yeah, well, I think there are huge opportunities there um, if, you, if you like telling all kinds of stories. The appeal of the Nick for me beyond its, its subject matter and the fact that it was about everything that I'm interested in, um, was just the size of the canvas. And I don't mean by, I don't mean that in a, in a, necessarily in a physical sense, although it was really fun to recreate that era. I'm talking about, in this case, a 20 hour movie. Um, I was really excited about that. And the, and the opportunities that, that it provides in terms of pure storytelling and character building um, it's a very different animal than a two hour feature. And sometimes, you know, sometimes there are ideas when somebody says, oh, you know, do you think this is a good idea? Do you think that's a movie idea or a TV idea? I do think there's some ideas that are really best told as movies. Um, but in the case of the Nick, it felt like it really benefited from being able to go that narrow and that deep into those characters. And as you know, um, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of, of, of auteur television, of, of having a filmmaker sort of unify an entire show. I, I really think that's a worthwhile pursuit because there's nothing, there's nothing that's quite like a, a singular voice unifying all the key decisions of a piece. It just, it's just a better result. If you can pull that off, I think it's a better result. Um, Did you find so yourself I, on the movies, or? on the TV shows that I produce? This is the model that I've been using. You find um, at, for a, a director in process, what are the differences? in the experience of directing, and are there any? Well, I've, I've, I'm in a very fortunate situation in which if I'm working in television, I, I don't have producers looking over my shoulder 
questioning what I'm doing and demanding coverage that I don't think is necessary. I think that's the biggest distinction in, in most situations uh, for television directors is just the, the sheer amount of coverage that most people demand. Yeah. And the reason we were able to shoot the Nick as fast as we were shooting it is I never had to worry about that. I, I, you know, I would get what I needed and then I would move on and nobody ever you know, complained. So that's the biggest issue. That's what takes the most time, is shots you don't need. Well spoken. Um, last, and it is the last question. What sure. would you recommend, particularly now, during this time, meaning the, you know, we're, we're shooting in bubbles now, meaning the actors are over here and the director's over here and, uh, and another of the twain shall meet. What would you recommend for our newer filmmakers to do uh, in the next six months, the next years in terms of their development? Well, my first, you know, reaction when all this got bad was to write which is not something that I enjoy doing, um, but there really wasn't much else for me to do. And I got into a rhythm and, and got a lot of work done. Um, now, as, as things slowly begin to open up, I, look, I think there are a couple of giant philosophical questions that each storyteller now needs to ask themselves. Um, the first is, if you're gonna tell a story that's set in contemporary times. For instance, you're gonna shoot something this fall that's gonna come out either next summer or next fall. What version of the present are you going to portray? You've got both the COVID world that you've gotta deal with, you've got the Black Lives Matter movement sort of surging in a way that, that we couldn't have anticipated and that I imagine will sustain. Then we have a presidential election coming up in November. Like I think the big, what uh, people I talk to right now are trying to figure out what is the present? Like what do we, how do we incorporate these huge upheavals that are taking place and, and imagine what a year from now is gonna be like? That's a problem, I mean, for people who are making period pieces right now, it's a big sigh of relief. They don't have to worry. But for most people who are making contemporary pieces, you know, what does now look like is a real question. So then the, then the, the corollary to that is, you know, can you, uh, are, in all the film festivals this fall and next year, are we gonna see like 900 Zoom movies? Like is, is, you know, is this a viable format for a long form piece? And that's kind of an open question. I've seen some really intriguing short pieces done in this kind of format, like really smart and interesting. But for, you know, for 90 minutes, if everybody is suddenly doing these, that's, that's, that's a problem. Got it. For, for our students who are going to be making things that are going to be from five minutes to 25 minutes, what kind of recommendations would, in, in this situation, um, what, re, what are you seeing and what kind of recommendations would you have for them? Well, I think there's, I think now there's, you can do a lot now that you couldn't do even three months ago. Like, I think there's a version now of being able to shoot something uh, safely and, and, and not be compromised. Um, whether, well, the other thing that's important, I, I get asked a lot, you know, why didn't you go to film school? And I tell the story of, well, I kind of did actually um, in, in high school. And because they say, well, like, well, does it matter? Should you go to film school? Why would anybody go to film school? You got all this equipment, you can just go out and shoot. Um, all of which is true, however, what I would argue um, about, what I would argue for in terms of film school, um, you know, if everybody can just ignore their, their instructors, um, is you need a gang. You need to be part of a gang. And what I, what I found when I was in high school, going to this classroom across campus and developing these relationships is 
you know, I became part of a gang and you need a gang to make something. And so that's important. The people, these students now, the connections you make during this time, these are probably going to last for a long time. There are people I'm working with now that I've known since I was 14 years old. So it's, it's, it's really crucial to make those connect, connection sounds weird. Those relationships are important. They're relationships. They're, 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 you're going to need these people and they will need you at some point. So, um, that was a way of not answering the second question. Although kind of what I was saying is don't feel like you're in this by yourself. You're not in it by yourself. So if you're thinking about how do I make something, what do I want to make? Well, start having that conversation with your friends. You know, that's, that's how I do it. When I think about what do, I, what do I want to do next, I talk to my friends and the people around me. And when you're editing with Mary um, and uh, working together, do you show your friends, because you said you, every day you're editing, do you yeah. show your friends that movie at a certain time? And Absolutely. Off? Absolutely. I'm usually within two or three days of wrapping, I'm already setting up a friends and family screening. It's sort of the, what's the phrase that uh, Ed Catmull uses in the Pixar book? Be wrong as fast as you can. <laughs> like, I want to I wanna know as quickly as possible, like, where are the problems? You know, and there have been a couple of movies I've done serious reshooting on um, because of friends and family screenings where you invite people that you really have to take a deep breath because you know they're going to tell you what they think. But they're also, you know, the reason that you have to do that if you have the right friends, in my case, I know they're rooting for me. They want me to succeed. It's, these criticisms aren't coming from a place of fear. They're coming from a place of support. Yeah. And they're the first people to go, hey, do you need to write some new stuff? Let's sit down, roll up our sleeves, and let's start. Like, these are people that get paid a lot of money to go fix things, but they're my friends, and they're like, let's, let's figure it out. Let's sit in the editing room and figure it out. Like, you need those people. Great, great. Well, listen, Stephen, we need you um, because of your creativity. and your Well, you just got a whole lot of me. I hope it wasn't too much. It was, it was fabulous. Uh, on a personal level, thanks. Um, good to be with you. Thank you for your insights. And of course, thank you for your creativity um, and, and your gang. Um, so we really appreciate well, well, you. Well, I want to say about you, sir, and encourage uh, everybody who's pursuing, you know, a career in this field. Um, when you start working and you, and you have the good fortune to become a member of one of these unions that we're a part of, uh, get involved like be get involved like the the years that i spent alongside jeremy at the directors guild were incredibly rewarding and i really encourage everybody to to you know don't don't just be someone who's aware that you're in a guild because every once in a while they send you something in the mail like you should really get involved it's worth it all right well you have been you are thank you stephen stay safe Good to see you. Are, are we not Great. going to student questions? Oh, oh. I've, I've, I've pulled a whole bunch of them, uh, Alex. Amazing. I didn't know specifically. Um, I thought the students were anticipating having a moment to come over and say hi. Oh, we can do that. The way Great. that we normally have. Um, well, let's, let's, uh, Alex, if, if Stephen's willing to do it, absolutely. Uh, I was referring to them as I was uh, asking uh, questions, but um, um, let's, let's, let's see where we are. Um, um, is, if Ella Grace Rodriguez is still here, she's asking about music, which would be great. We haven't talked about it. So, Ellen? Ella, we're going to move you over to be a panelist for a moment. Okay, great. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, thanks, thanks for sticking, sticking with us, Stephen. Sure. Hi. Hi there. So nice to meet you. Um, so I come from a musical background. And so to me, um, the ending scene, while it's kind of probably well known um, of Ocean's Eleven, you use Debussy's Claire de Lune from his suite in one of the final scenes. And you mentioned earlier about how you kind of take um, previous artists' work 
and you kind of use that as a background and I love how you alluded to it with a beautiful orchestral arrangement but um, to what extent, I guess, um, why did you pick that piece out of all the classical pieces that you could have selected? And how do you think that amplified or um, perhaps enhanced the ending of that film? Well, there were two things going on there. Um, I'd always been a big WC fan my whole life. Um, but then there was a more direct theft from Philip Kaufman's The Right Stuff um, there's, a, there's a moment within that film in which uh, the aspiring astronauts are watching a performance on a stage. Um, and it's very beautiful and very ethereal. And the music is used in a similar fashion. Um, and I always loved that sequence and justified the, the theft um, by thinking, oh, it's been long enough, you know, 1983 to 2001, it's been long enough I can get away with this. But I made sure that I thanked uh, Philip Kaufman in the end credits, because I feel if you're gonna steal, you should sort of shout out to the people you stole from. Great, great. Is uh, Richard Heredia Ariaga there? He's asking a question about editing uh, uh, on uh, Out of Sight. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Ella. Thanks, Ella. Stay safe. So um, I don't know. You find him? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm sort of. He's coming in. Oh, good. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks, Steve. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. you. One second. Coming on. Oh. Hey. Hello. Uh, um, hello, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. Sure. I had a question um, in terms of editing, in particular on Out of Sight and the sequence in the bar between Jennifer Lopez and George Clooney. I've always been fascinated by your use of time and space and how it's fragmented. And I just wondered if you could speak on that particular um, editing sequence and your influence on that. Okay, so you, <laughs> another story of, of me stealing something or trying to steal something um, in this case. So there's a, a film that Nicholas Rogue made called Don't Look Now, uh, 1974. And there's a, there's a sequence of Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie um, getting dressed to go out and also spending intimate time together in bed. And you're not sure, like, wait, is this before or after? It's really kind of just, it's, it's a, a scene about the intimacy that married people have that's unique. And he, he comes up with this really fascinating way to put this sequence together. So I had that in mind when we were shooting uh, that section of Out of Sight and I was explaining to Ann Coates, the editor, that that was the kind of effect that I wanted, that we were going forwards and backwards um, and that it, made, that it made emotional sense. It was tracking the emotion of the scene, but it, it didn't make any literal sense. Um, so, we put that together and it, and it seemed to be fine. But as it turns out, like two years later, I watched Don't Look Now and it didn't look anything like what I had remembered. I had remembered it wrong. Like I, I, I had remembered it completely wrong. Like he does do some cross cutting there, but it's not, it doesn't look anything like what I thought I was recreating uh, in Out of Sight. So it's kind of an example of how my memory turned it into something that it wasn't, which in this case turned out to be good. Yeah. But I'd, I'd literally, I'd remembered it all wrong. I'm, I'm glad you didn't watch it the night before. I know, I know. <laughs> Ryan, Henry McKennion, if you're here, Ryan McKennion. Uh, Jeremy, uh, yeah. as I had mentioned earlier, we, we should call on the people that we have put in the chat just because we've had oh. a, an opportunity to make sure that we know that it's... I see. I'm sorry. I've yeah, been going okay. through the Q and A. Okay. Um, what, um, so we should we should invite over um, alumnus Derek Mio. If he's still here. Oh. I guess I'm not seeing the chat. That's why. I see. I see. I see where you are. So, so I was do, I was going to the Q and A. Hey there. Hey. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, being here with us, Stephen. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you've been an innovator and you've embraced new technologies and 
financing models. Um, and right now, you know, the landscape is so uh, stratified, you know, um, and you touched upon kind of where we're at, but could you talk about kind of where we're at, where you see, um, you know, cinema headed? I know it's not going to die, but, um, you know, we have so many different distribution outlets and ways to raise money for films. Drive-in theaters are coming back. So just your, your kind of general thoughts about the current state. Yeah, it's, look, it's, we're all, I think, really concerned and anxious to know how the theatrical distribution part of the business is going to return and, and when. Um, it's, it, 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 it's not going to go away because it can't go away for a lot of reasons. Um, some of them are just social reasons. It's still the number one date destination for most people. And secondly, um, there is still no equivalent really in any other aspect of the business of the kind of financial windfall that a movie can generate when it blows up and makes a billion dollars. Like there's nothing else like it. And as a result, we will always chase that. Um, and, you know, I think the real concern right now is how are these how are these exhibitors going to survive? Because I don't think it's imminent that we're going to have people showing up in theaters. And as some of you may have read, the antitrust consent decree that used to ban studios from owning theater chains was just uh, rescinded. So this means potentially studios can now buy theater chains that may end, may end up in a weird way at least solving the problem in the short term because they can theoretically, you know, Warners or Amazon or anybody could buy one of these chains and go, okay, we're going to sit on this until we're all ready to go back and then we will reinfuse it with funds to get it back where it was. Um, I think in the next couple of months, there are going to be some big moves that are made at that level uh, that'll give us more information about how the new theatrical business is going to work. But it's it, like I said, there's too much money in it for it not to come back. It's, it's, it'll come back. And then real quick, Stephen, what was it like after having done Contagion to see COVID, like to see co Contagion basically play out <laughs> in real yeah, time? It's very strange. There are obviously a lot of things that um, we didn't anticipate uh, that we probably should have. But I, 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 was, I was kind of stunned when I was first having conversations with uh, our, our colleagues that work in that field, uh, when they started you know, talking about what COVID-19 was and how it was gonna work and how it spread, it was very, uh, it was unsettling. But again, when we did, when we did Contagion, everybody we talked to in epidemiology uh, to a person said, this will happen um, and we think it'll be a wet market in Asia and we think there will be a bat involved. Like wow. that's how specific they were. Wow. That's amazing. Every, every one of them. Amazing. That's crazy. So, is, is Naomi Shroff Thank you so Meta? much for being here. Is uh, Naomi Shroff Meta here? Because she's asking, actually, uh, if she is, hopefully, if she comes on, she's asking about uh, comedy uh, versus uh, dr drama. And, uh, I is there a difference for you in terms of your directing? Hey, moving Na Naomi over now. There Great. she is. Hi. Um, Na Naomi, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. There she Hello. Hi. Uh, hi, thank you so much for this. This has been really awesome. Thank you for all of this. Um, so you yeah, got to it up. Yes, <laughs> it's to make it a little more interesting. Um, so in terms of, because uh, you really span across genres, um, does your directing style change at all? Or do you kind of have different methods um, when tackling different scripts of uh, different genres? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to work, I'm trying to work out from the material itself um, and determine you know, who, who I should be to best, I'm the delivery system for the idea. And so I kind of, I'm just looking at it as what's the best format for people to take this on. 
Um, and sometimes, look, in the case of the informant, you know, Scott Burns came to me, and I think the original conception was that it would be a drama, that it would be like The Insider. And I said, well, I don't know how to do that better than what Michael Mann did on The Insider. I don't know how to make a better version of The Insider, Scott. W w you know, you need to write the version of this that only you know how to write. So what is that? And he goes, well, I've always wanted to write a movie in which the narrator was making it harder for you to believe what you were seeing and understand what you were seeing. <laughs> like they were literally like trying to pull you out of the film. And I said, well, do that. And so that's how we ended up doing that. Um, and then on the laundromat, you know, it was similar in the sense that I said, look, I, I, what, what's happening, this kind of behavior is so outrageous that I think the only way to do it is to make a, a, a very dark comedy out of this in which essentially there are several different styles embedded within the film. Um, now look, like I said, very polarizing movie. Some people didn't lock into that at all. Um, but in retrospect, it was the only way I could think of to, to make it stick to people so that at least they, they wouldn't be able to say, oh, it's like that other thing that I saw. Um, and, and that was, that was the way to go. I think, I guess we'll find out 20 years from now. By the way, when you're, when you're doing a gag, like, uh, like in Ocean's 13, there's a gag where the money, money is being, or the cards are being, uh, trying to fi figure out how to do it. Uh, and all of a sudden they go flying in the back. Uh, it, this is, I don't know if you really remember yeah. that. those kind of gags, um, are these, preconceived gag, well, that must have been because it's had an effect to it. But, you know, interestingly enough, you, you do have a, your own sense of humor. And I'm wondering when you push for a gag um, or like in the uh, uh, Logan Lucky, the, the two brothers that are sort of really almost cartoon figures, how you decide to go for that. I think, you know, I'm always looking for visual stuff that's not in the center of the frame that you can do to, to, to play out. Um, that's always fun to, in that situation, go a little bit for a proscenium just because you're hiding something that, that's indirect. Um, and there are times when, you know, you can set something up where the laugh is essentially in in the edit. Um, it. It's almost an indestructible, you know, gag of having a character either ask a question or declare that they will never do something. And then whatever you cut to pretty much can be funny if you've set it up properly. Um, so that one never goes away. But I think it's, even within a drama, I think it can be really important to have a moment of humor to, to sort of let people release. You know, when, when we talk about, when people talk about Jaws, everybody talks about how genuinely funny the movie is. There, there are huge laughs in the movie on top of everything else. Um, same with Close Encounters. So, you know, I think it's important to find levity if it's organic. Uh, instead of basic, basic, even the good Shakespeare dramas, you've got the comedies in the midst of oh, yeah. drama. So, yeah, I love the, the, the illustration. Let's take one more question um, from Ryan Henry uh, McKennion. I think I got that right. Um, if Ryan's here. And... Yeah, so. Uh, I, I, now. There you are. Oh, cool. Hi. Hi, thanks so much for uh, being with us. Um, sure. today. I had a question about, you know, as someone who um, edits and shoots a lot of their own work, um, about how you make the decision whether or not you're going to do that for a given project, or if you're going to bring on additional collaborators, and, you know, is it your decision? I'm sure it's a, also a confluence of decisions of multiple parties um, on a given project, but how do you make that, that call? I guess, I guess it depends on to what extent I feel really 
uh, clear on, on what I'm trying to do. And because here's what I don't want to do is I don't want to be in a situation where I'm just sitting behind somebody's shoulder telling them what to do. Um, and so if I feel like the, the, whatever the project is feels like I would be doing that, then, then I, will, I will do it myself. Then there are projects where I feel like it would be really nice to have another set of eyes on this. And, and there also may be some production aspect that it'll make my life, my quality of life easier if I have somebody to work with instead of, so in the case, for instance, of Contagion, that project just really felt to me like I needed, like Stephen Mary, I wanted Stephen Marioni, you know, in the kitchen while that was being made. Like, it just felt like the right thing to do because of what it was, uh, where, how it was being made, how often we were traveling from place to place. It just seemed really obvious to me that he should be involved. As it turns out, that was a movie that went through a very intense period of editing and reshooting that he was a really important part of. So it just depends. Although I have to say, selfishly, it's the part of the job I like the most. And so I think as I get older, um, I'm clinging to it even more. So I don't know when the next time will be that, um, that I have a collaborator. And, and, and let me just end with a, that question. Why do you like that part of the job the most? It's the reward. Like now you get to, after all this effort, now you get to see what you've got. And there's really no, there's really nothing like it exactly in any other art form. Uh, it's just a com completely unique uh, activity and I just never get tired of it. It's why I post stuff on the website that I have, you know, that I've just edited or re-edited for fun. It's just, I, I love it more than anything else. Great. Steven, thank you, man. Okay. We really appreciate it. See you in 20 years. You got it. Stay safe. Okay. <laughs>